Hey. How are you doing? Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, good. Uh, I'm all right. It's been a... It's been a challenging week. But I'm okay. Well, challenging weeks happen. <laughs> What's that? Challenging weeks happen. Yeah, yeah. Sounds like you've been pretty busy yourself. Yeah, yeah. So, hello, Andrew. I'm a jury. Hi. Good. Need to see. Uh, so, yeah, and Jesse said that we might see some people come in who are typically I, not. Involved. I invited a couple people from that. I just arrived at the location that Angela or uh, Avery is at, like in the UK. They just went to the same location. I don't think they're going to show up, but I just extended them an invitation because they're doing some kind of adjacent stuff. So. Okay. That's good. That's good. Um, we have someone here. Oh, hello. Hi, how are you? Doing pretty well. Good. Yeah. Is that Avery? Yes. Yep. Oh, cool. Welcome. Yeah. Welcome Ooh. to the meeting. Uh, does anyone have any news or anything they want to talk about before we get started? Okay. Um, I, we've been working on the uh, position descriptions, so that's uh, that continues. And uh, I know that Jesse sent me some, or I think Ankit Grover, who's a person Jesse uh, told them to contact me. That person, I contacted them, and it looks like they've joined one of the Slack, a couple of the Slack channels. So hopefully, you know, there will be more interaction there. Mm. So. Yeah, I'm, I don't know if they're going to be joining today, um, but... I assume they got an email or something like that. Uh, yeah, I sent an email um, with the Slack invite, so, and then, yeah, so that's good. Um, and Maduri, thank you for returning for a second uh, week. <laughs> Hi, yes, no problem at all. Uh, I may have to uh, leave a bit early if that's all right. Yeah. Yeah, no problem. Um, yeah, just, just you know, we're pretty flexible in the meetings and, and, and whatnot. It's, uh, I just was wanted to make sure that you weren't overwhelmed from last time, that you were doing okay. No, no, no not at all. Um, I was actually um, drafting an email um, and I, would, um, I should be able to send that by Monday to you and Jesse about... Uh, what, what I could do. Okay, yeah, that's good. Yeah, it's good to think about that. We get some feedback because we were talking about, you know, about the roles that we have on uh, on the web that are listed. And, you know, it, I don't want to push anyone into any role that they don't want to do or that they don't feel like is something they want to spend time on because I want this to be productive. Right. So, uh, right. yeah. So, I mean, you know, whatever you want to, you know, whatever role you want to do is, is just, you know, we can talk about it more. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. so, and, um, I got an email from Daniela as well, or a message from Daniela. I actually asked her if she was interested in some of the roles and she's got, uh, had a couple of things she's interested in. So we'll talk about those, I think, uh, coming up. So, um, and I, so I didn't want to restrict the roles that we have listed to people who are we're recruiting from outside the lab. If you're in the lab and you want to, you know, say, oh, this is, I didn't know this was going on. Um, I didn't know we were thinking about it this way. And then, then please let me know and we can, um, you know, maybe talk more about that, those specific areas. Because in the meetings, we just kind of hit what we can, um, you know, what, what's, what's current what people are working on we don't really often talk about what people might want to do so 
Okay, so let's get started. I, I wanted to talk first of all, um, Angela, I hope you're not going to be too upset, but, <laughs> well, and I don't know about upset, but I said that we would talk about the data trusts um, presentation. So is that something that you want to do today or? I don't think my slides are formatted the way that I agreed to do it yet because I end up putting like, um, actually I just sent it to you through Slack so you can take a look. Basically okay. it's fewer slides but more content on each slide than is a minute's worth and I want to try to get it to the way I agreed to with you but it's probably not ready yet unless you think you want me to like present this in like <laughs> slightly more or less time i don't know like well, why don't, why don't we you. just go through it real quick and it doesn't have to be like a formal presentation but just something where we can i can we can uh talk about it in the group here well you know i know jesse might want to ha have some comments on it and and things nothing like really you know super critical or anything just just you know what it might you know sorts of things that we have say in the uh, ethics and society group and how that might play off of that sure yeah and it'll be fun when i try to answer questions and i'm just like what do i do yeah. okay <laughs> okay all for it all right okay should i share my screen hang on yes okay window chromium tab just as Here. a it's very okay for preliminary like things don't have to be perfect when you when you share them in the lab like, yeah it's good to do this Okay, you guys can see, right? Yes. All yes. right. Data trusts. <laughs> so, why am I interested in them? So, number one, what is it? Data is placed on the control of a board of trustees with a fiduciary responsibility to look after the interests of the beneficiaries. Basically, you tell this board, hey, here's my data. Make sure it doesn't fuck me over. So, there are many working definitions. I still think the one I gave is pretty accurate. But basically, a set of relationships underpinned by a repeatable framework, compliant with parties' obligations to share data in a fair and safe, equitable way. Mm -hmm. The one that I'm going with is just a simple, a data trust provides independent fiduciary stewardship of data. There are many mass collection, uh, data collection problems. So, because right now companies decide what to collect and for what purpose. Individuals don't get a say. The harms are collective to the public externalities and the benefits to the corporation. And the consequences are very hard to understand for the individual user. But who gets to make decisions about our data? Very often, a corporation. Um, the director of the corporation is, you know, acting in the interest of the shareholders, which is basically whoever, you know, they care about profit, not necessarily privacy or the public good, sadly. However, you can, like, there are other methods that people have tried, like personal data stores, by placing the data with the internet user, but that's pretty hard because while it puts the user back in control, there are many things that limit our ability to decide what we would want to, like, do, right? Like we have decision fatigue, like, oh my gosh, so many options. What do I do? I give up. Um, data is shared. Like all this data is shared by people and your sharing data affects me. Like even if I choose not to give my data, like all the data of the neighbors next to me still like affects me, right? Um, there's the giant power imbalance of corporations versus us, near little us. And data commons is one solution to it. Basically, to um, open knowledge repository that combines data from public data sets using mapped common entities. A specific part of data commons um, is the idea of data trusts, in which you just hand over the data rights to a board of trustees who will govern it, knowing, like, you know, benevolent dictator. <laughs> okay, not dictator, but yeah. Um, so this solves a few things that were solved by the other solutions, like data privacy concerns. So yeah, like what I said before, when you share your DNA with services like 23andMe, the data reveals a lot about your family's genetic makeup. And what you share on social media influences your friends' insurance premiums. All of this, right? Oops, I forgot to put that in. Sorry. <laughs> okay. 
So the key elements of a data trust, there are four themes. Um, one is obviously legal requirements, um, legal authority to collect, hold, or share data, especially under like GDPR, like the General Data Protection Rights uh, for the European Union. Um, they need an accountable governing body to ensure that the data trust achieves its stated purpose and is transparent. So another independent body to like for oversight, by the way. Um, comprehensive data management, including clear processes and qualified individuals responsible for collection, storage, access, disclosure, and use of data. So a way to manage these with the processes that processes that anyone can see is okay. Training and accountability requirements for all data users before they agree to this and ongoing public and stakeholder engagement. It doesn't matter how much of it is ongoing as long as it gets it done. So here are the 12 minimum specifications. So a data trust needs all of these and the first one is just legal. I'll get to the rest now. Governance has to have a stated purpose, be transparent with an accountable governing body and be adaptive because a lot of like technology moves really fast. We really want, you know, ethics to move <laughs> with it. Otherwise, we're not going to be very happy with the consequences. So management, well-defined policies and processes for the collection, storage, use, and disclosure of data, which include data protection safeguards that are updated regularly for the reasons I just said. And an ongoing process to identify, assess, and manage risks that's very common in the world of big data, right? We don't want a data breach, and if you do have one, you want a process for accountability, for sure. Our data users must complete training. Oh, by the way, please let me know if I exceed time. Okay. <laughs> Our data users must complete training before they access data. I like this idea a lot, but like... Um, they will agree to a data user agreement that isn't just like, oh, you don't just click agree after not reading the terms and services, basically. Like, we want to have them know that there are consequences for non-compliance, so they actually read and complete the training. <laughs> so, public and stakeholder engagement. There should be early and ongoing engagement with the stakeholders, including members of the public where there is a reasonable expectation that specific subpopulations or groups would have a particular interest in or would be affected by an activity of the data trust, there should be direct engagement tailored for that subpopulation group because they're the people who will be affected, of course. Yeah? Sorry. Was someone saying something? Maybe I imagined that. <laughs> okay. Some points of consideration. It would be more difficult for international because cross-border data trusts will have to identify multiple legal requirements. And example, the EU's GDPR, sorry, GDPR, um, that is anyone who decides to say, deal with data with a European Union citizen will have to um, make sure it's compliant with that too. There are typically binding terms and conditions in data sharing agreements established between legal entities when data are shared. Like when two corporations share data, usually there are their specific terms and conditions as well that you have to consider. Um, and there will be project specific requirements detailed in the documentation. Like um, obvious example, research ethics boards. So consent is extremely important and you want to make sure it's IRB compliant, etc. Here are some ideas on what to consider when designing your data trust. Um, actually, yeah. So obviously there's funding with many different ones that all have to do with, basically it has to be separate from like corporations and profit and such, which is why there are these options here. Um, executing organizations doesn't matter as much, though if it's a state-run organization, it depends on how it's done, yeah. How trustees make decisions about data sharing. I am working on some more slides on that. This is actually, um, there are some pretty interesting ideas they have, like consent champions or the average of actively chosen settings. So like, um, actually, 
I'll, I'm not certain about that yet, so once I do, I'll read it. <laughs> yeah, so here are the ideas that you can read. I don't know how much time I should spend on this. <laughs> decisions, decisions, decisions. So these are some things to consider when making the decisions, like, hey, what objectives and values should govern these decisions? Who are the stakeholders and their incentives? Very important incentives. What policies, processes, and activities will the trust use to make and enforce its decisions? And most importantly, what accountability mechanisms? <laughs> yeah. So deliberative means like here is what makes a process deliberative, which is what they mentioned in their article. Um, discussion between participants, involvement of a range of people, and a clear task or purpose. So here are some um, deliberative methods that is commonly used slash could be used to have a data trust make better deliberate decisions. A real life example actually is Facebook's oversight board trust because it's pretty cool. So Facebook has the platform already to basically have an oversight board within its platform, right? but like it wanted something separate so that it can actually have accountability of Facebook as like the corporation. So like they took advantage of, sorry, not took advantage. They used Delaware's extremely flexible purpose trust statute um, to facilitate the creation, funding, management, and oversight of a structure that will permit and protect the operation of an oversight board for content decisions. So they basically decide, oh, what's okay or not to post on Facebook. Mm -hmm. And it would be completely separate. It would be independent of Facebook is the most important part. Um, my friend Serena actually makes this data trust experimentation. So basically, the abolition of private ownership of data replaced by collective decision making over the use of collectively produced data. Mm -hmm. So because the loss of privacy should never result in a loss of social power. Mm -hmm. Some future possibilities. These are not required for data trust, but People agree that it's generally a pretty cool idea if it exists. Dynamic consent for data subjects in cases where data require consent for collection. So you can choose, oh, I consent to this, but not this, etc. Under these conditions or something. Data traceability so that data trusts can fully execute on patient consent withdrawal, bias monitoring, audits, and regulatory agency review. Wow. Standard and computable data use conditions, secure and auditable computing environments, and public engagement that goes beyond informational transparency and interactivities like co-design and deep involvement of data subjects and governance. I actually haven't read that much into like co-design stuff and the rest, but it looks pretty interesting. Thank you. Thank you. That <laughs> Any was good. questions? Oh. Okay, I didn't know what I was doing good. Well, yeah, I think, that, yeah, I mean, you know, some of it we can, oh, hey, oh, how are hi. you? It's uh, Morgan. <laughs> hi. And we have some, uh, we have another person who joined us here. I think that was just me. I'm setting up my iPad. So. Oh, okay. All right. So, yeah, Morgan's setting up his earphones. I think you're muted. And he, yeah. And then we have some, uh, who's, is there a new person here? Nope. J.I.? Oh. Okay. Well, anyways, welcome, Morgan. Um, and so, yeah, back to um, questions on um, Angela's uh, talk. Do we have uh, any questions that you had when you were watching that you just said, oh, this makes sense in light of something we've seen in the last couple of weeks or something that like is a long-standing question. I guess I would, uh, actually, if you could share your screen again, Angela, I just wanted to make some points about some of the, oh, sure. yeah. So yeah, I guess when you're like going through the talk, when you're continuing to build it, um, so, some of the, like, when you have some of the 
uh, slides with a lot of text on them, like the tables. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm well, that's okay. But yeah, well, I mean, just make sure that you highlight what you're going to talk about next, you know, just to guide yeah. people through that and say, I'm going to talk about three of these. Um, okay. Yeah. So like, yeah. And then I think like a lot of it is was pretty informative. And, you know, I'm thinking about our audience that we're, we're going to present to, um, you know, they, they've had a lot of issues with uh, data privacy, especially surrounding like, you know, how to manage the COVID crisis. So one of the oh. things that they've done in the university setting is they've instituted a testing regime where people, you know, give their medical or they, they're giving this medical data basically to the, um, to the, uh, like the health department. And then the health department is working with the university to make sure that there's compliance. So people are getting tested and then the testing information goes in. And then, you know, if you get like a positive test or a negative test, and then if you're getting vaccinated, there's also a record of that. And all those things are really, rec you know, medical records. So there's like a, a privacy need there. And people don't want the university to go any farther than that. You know, people are worried that like, this is something that they would do, you know, in the future. Like, you know, if they wanted to do something, you know, apply it to like some other thing that they wanted to get compliance on. So I think it's interesting that there's this, and I just wanted to make you aware of this beforehand, that there have been these conversations about managing COVID and how to apply technology to that process. That's really kind of, I think fits into this to some extent. Um, but I, you know, I don't know, I guess a data trust in that sense would make sense, like for medical records would be uh, quite a nice uh, way to, to get around some of these problems because, you know, everyone knows like, you know, it, it's secure and everyone knows kind of how it's being managed. And, and so, uh, but, you know, in a situation where you have to ramp something up in like, you know, a month or less to get it going, then, you know, you might have this problem where you, you don't really have the processes in place for oversight. I think you mentioned Facebook's oversight committee, which is, <laughs> um, you know, I don't know how people feel about like how Facebook's been doing. I don't, my, my impression has been not great, but this is a problem. <laughs> well, this is a problem generally with like these kind of boards. Like if you scale up to the size of Facebook, you know, is it, is it something that you can just do? You know, you, you, you make rules and, and a lot of committees make rules and they don't get followed through on or they're impractical to implement. So, I mean, you know, that's, that's another thing to think about. Like if we had an oversight board, you know, um, what happens if it's just kind of unimplementable? Like the, again, in the university setting, you know, you have like committees all the time and they give recommendations about things. And then, you know, there are people who have to implement this, say in terms of policy or technology. And so how do they, how do you make sure that they do it? Um, or is it just something that they recommend and then people sort of wad it up and throw it in the trash or they say, well, we'll do it another way that's technically more feasible, but thanks for playing, you know, those sorts of things. And it just, you know, I'm just, this, these are things, kind of things that I'm thinking about. And I don't know if there's an answer to that, but I think uh, I want to prepare you for questions too. So like when, when people ask questions about this, that you'll kind of thought about it. Yeah, and you can also send me the link to what they were discussing about privacy, um, data privacy and yeah. COVID. Yeah, because I'd be interested in having my slides relate to that somehow. Yeah, yeah, I think actually, uh, yeah, I can do that. And, you know, this is this is a, what I'm talking about is a context where they've worked out privacy considerations. Um, but, you know, it's still like one of these things where you know, how do you, like, if you're managing data in a setting like, you know, a mobile app or some sort of, like, you know, real-time thing like Facebook, how do you really make sure that this all get, this all works well, I guess. So I'll send you some more information on that. Thanks. Yeah. So I know Jesse had a question. Well, I was just going to ask, like, when you we were talking, I don't know if I missed something, but people are saying they and the audience and who, who is they and the audience that, that we're talking about? 
Uh, well, Wait, we have, huh? Oh, oh Wait, so th <laughs> yeah, this is for this uh, lecture series that that Angel will be presenting at, and it's. I'm just thinking about like a broader audience outside this lab. Um, so, you know, it's going to be like our group at the University of Illinois that we're uh, working with, and I'm just thinking about some of the issues that I've heard about this year in the last two years, maybe. Uh, so this is what I mean by they, and it's really just audience outside of this group. Okay. So, um, yeah, just to make that clear. But I, you know, um, but I think like a lot of these issues are very broad, broadly applicable to different things. So. Yeah, I, I think this is a good presentation. I liked it. I, I, I don't know the most about data trust directly, but I feel like this is you know, in the vein of, there was something I I saw on Twitter that I wanted to tag everybody in, but I don't know if I did properly. Uh, it was kind of adjacent to this stuff. Um, but this is a really good, uh, I really like the presentation. I'm surprised anyone understood it. Thank you. <laughs> it's a lot. Like, I'm getting used to what it is, so I have to, like, meditate on it. But, like, it's, it was a good, like, hey, this is a pass-through. Uh, for me, so thinking about it more and like, I don't know, like, uh, I, yeah, I, I feel like it, there's a lot of things that I would ask more about, but I don't have the questions for them right now. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a good, like, primer for that. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. I mean, by the time I actually do the presentation, hopefully I'll have had like a plan of what to say next time. This was kind of a speed run. I don't know what I'm doing. Oh. Uh -huh. That was very good. In that sense. <laughs> Any other questions? I'm going to ask anything. If I don't know the answer, just say I don't know or I'll think you something. <laughs> I mean, I would just point out, too, that, you know, you could use practical examples, like you use Facebook's oversight board. There, there may be some other examples, and I'll send you information on, on some practical examples, but... Uh, oh, like biobanks, maybe? Yeah, that could be one. Yeah, just to kind of go through that, just just so that people know kind of what, how this has been implemented. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so you have, like, something like biobanks, or, you know, how do you, what are the, how does it get kind of put in place? What are the steps? Even if it's not like something that's perfect, you know, it's just something that the people are using it instead of it just being this theoretical thing. Yeah. It would be cool if I put in slides to show how to implement a data trust yourself. Because I didn't actually go into that, did I? <laughs> well, yeah, that would actually be a pretty good one. Um, so people could do it or at least think about how to do it yeah. in their own case. It would be tough to make it match all the um, rules and regulations, but I'm sure somewhere out there, like I found contracts on data trusts. I didn't read through it properly, but it looks like it's going to be a really annoying thing to try to make. But also, I think it probably wouldn't be more annoying than making any other like corporation related thing. So, yeah, I was going to say, like, I don't know. I might have missed if you brought this up in, in the talk here, but. Um when I was trying to fill in my iPad. Uh, like, there was an experiment a while ago, and I, I imagine you know about it, but I don't know if it was, like, it could be used as, a, a, like, a comparison, but I remember someone, like, basically incorporated themselves and, like, made themselves a... Like, they, they made all their data, like, corporate data, and it was very, like... I considered doing something like that before. <laughs> that might be, like, an interesting, like, alternative to compare to like, well, this is what somebody did and here's how it went. I don't know. I have no idea. I remember yeah. seeing some articles about it like three or four years ago or something to kind of combat to almost like merging with the matrix of, of the stuff <laughs> both away from it. So like, I don't, I mean, I'm not sure that would be of any use to, to mention here, but like, uh, yeah. I will research that more because that's pretty interesting. I have thought about it myself on my own. I didn't know someone did that kind of thing. <laughs> they did it, I believe. And and I don't know, like, I'll look really quickly, but, like... Beyond just, like, 
having your name as a corporation or something. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I can't find any current articles to read it this one. But if I see anything, I'll let you know. Thanks. Yeah. That's good. Um, thank you for that, Angela. Uh, we'll be revisiting this uh, maybe in next week or the week after, see what kind of progress you've made on it. Uh, make sure that we have, keep up on it, you know, keep going. Um, okay. All right, so next, actually, if you could stop sharing your screen. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't even realize. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so um, let's see. Next thing I want to talk about is go over the Slack channels. I just wanted to share my screen, and I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because we're going to do some other things. But um, I'll know, say, well, welcome, uh, Morgan. I don't think I've seen oh, you yeah. yeah, what Yeah, Morgan, why don't you introduce yourself for people who probably haven't. Uh, met you before. Sure. Hi, I'm Morgan. Um, I had been on Slack uh, um, maybe about eight or nine months ago, um, posting on Cerebral Organoids. Um, and, um, and Bradley and I, we spoke with a grad student down at UC Santa Cruz that uh, is developing, or is in a lab that's working on some interesting open source uh, uh, technologies that will relate to uh, cerebral organoids and their their growth and, and development. Uh, so just just trying to catch up on on what's been going on recently and uh, looking over uh, both the Slack and uh, and uh, and some of the articles that you posted. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for joining. Uh, you also have a neural background. I know some people uh, here might be yeah. interested in that. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm a neuroimager by training, um, you know, uh, MRI, fMRI, uh, that kind of high density EEG. Uh, and, uh, yeah, and, and I've been an active part, uh, or until recently, it was an active part of uh, Neurotech X, uh, which I think we talked a little bit in Slack as well. Um, and uh, that's, you know, that's a community of, of developers and neuroscientists and other interested parties that are also developing kind of open source technologies, uh, hardware, software for uh, looking at, uh, I've, got, I've got devices all across my desk here. Uh, you know, things, things like, the, uh, I mean, we've got a, got a notion here. These, these kinds of EEG devices. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, and uh, so I, I didn't quite catch the, the data trust, but, uh, you know, it's, some of these groups are also collecting data and making that available for others. Um, so, you know, in a kind of data commons. Yeah. Oh, I don't know how much that was covered already, but I'd love to, love to see briefly. that Google Doc or that Google Docs being shared. Trust. Sorry, what? Oh, yeah. Did you ask about the trust talk? I actually yeah, didn't hear my. Uh, uh, is there a like a agenda link on the? I've, I'm catching oh, up. My, my yeah, I, 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 I didn't put out an agenda. Yeah. Um, sure. yeah. <laughs> Sorry, but yeah. So. Yeah, well, we'll revisit the data trust. I'm not quite sure it's ready to share yet, but I mean, you know, oh. we'll, <laughs> but uh, this is something that Angela is going to present in November to a group. Uh, so it'll be polished by then. We'll, we'll talk more about it, though. Uh, and yeah, I, I, I haven't been able to get around to the neural organoids as much as I would like in the past, you know, several months. But um, yeah, I'd like to really revisit that. I know Maduri, who's a new person in the group, she has some interest in like uh, neuro and, and maybe maybe some organoid stuff. I don't know if she's, uh, I don't, I mean, she doesn't have any experience in it, but like, you know, she's interested in that, in that direction, so. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll be trying to catch up on the Slack with, uh, with you know, relevant links, uh, because, you know, there's, there's been a lot of, a lot yeah. of great progress, yeah. yeah. Yeah, for those who don't know, there's a Brain Organoids channel in our Slack. Um, that's Morgan's been pretty active there, along with, I think Jessica a while back was there. What was her name? 
Um, did we also have, was there also a Discord or was that for like critical periods or something else? Uh, that was for critical periods. So, okay. I did, well, yeah, that didn't really include any of the organoid stuff, but. Okay. Then it's just the Slack, if for people who are kind of wondering about what we're talking about, there's a whole channel in our Slack um, called Brain, Brain-Organoids, I believe. And there's uh, there's been some periodic update, but Mark was a major contributor to that, and uh, I guess we're going to do more, so you check that out. Katarina from uh, Katarina. CSCS, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, why don't we go to the Slack now? And um, So this is in your CBS Yeah, thanks for the update. Uh, that, was, that was really good. So. Yeah. So this is the Brain Organized channel. Yeah, so this is where we have... We've had a couple things. We, we have a lot of papers in here. So this is good if you wanted to learn about brain organoids and some of the things that they've been applied to. So they're, you know, they're uh, organoids in general, which are these uh, plus, you know, these aggregations of cells that people will build in the lab. So they'll take like a stem cell and they'll, and they'll expand the population, which means they'll let the cells divide. And then they'll differentiate them into brains, little, little like, you know, uh, proto brains, uh, or they'll maybe create organs like livers or hearts. You know, I don't think anyone's created a heart, but what you can do is you can take the medium that the cells are growing in and condition it so that the cells will differentiate into different uh, types of uh, different fates. So, you know, the cells will have like a neural fate or a skin cell fate or some type of neuron. And if you're growing them in these clusters, and I think this paper is a good example. If you're growing them in these clusters, uh, if you have a population of cells, they'll actually form these sort of proto tissues. So they'll, you know, they'll start signaling each other as they're growing in proximity, and then they'll form these these uh, layered structures, or they'll form like, you know, distinct uh, clusters of cells that have different functionality, and they can you can actually do like electrophysiological measurements on them. And they have these outputs that are kind of like a brain. So, you know, the, people use these as uh, model systems. So we have model organisms and we have uh, cell culture, which is just like the uh, one-dimensional cell culture, the, you know, the layered cell culture. And this is actually something where you have like a three-dimensional cell culture where you have these structures that are sort of try to approximate organs. So you can see there are these blobs like this that they grow. And so you can, you, grow, you start, yeah, it takes like, you know, 140 days to get something where you have a high degree of differentiation and you have structure and you have this sort of functional uh, complexity. And so you can model, you know, all sorts of uh, things with organoids, developmental diseases, you can model, uh, maybe like the origins of function. I mean, there are a lot of things you can model potentially with organoids. Um, it's, you know, it's it's something that there are a growing number of labs working on this. They're trying to perfect a lot of these uh, protocols and getting the cells to, you know, sort of uh, behave in culture. That's always a challenge with cell culture. But, um, you know, you have this, so basically you have these cells, you put them in a, in a matrix uh, you guide them along, you get them to differentiate into different types of cells, in this case, a number of different types of neural cell, just like you would see in the brain. And then you get these uh, little functional structures that are kind of like they mimic the brain in some way. And uh, so that that's that's what these organoids are. And so, if, you know, go through this channel and, and there are a lot of good papers in here, a lot of good uh, links to read about this. And if you're interested, join the channel and, you know, maybe we can talk about doing something. Uh, I We've talked, uh, Morgan and myself talked about getting some secondary data where you're trying to analyze, you know, they, they produce data sets, uh, different labs that, that do the, the wet lab aspect to this. They produce data sets that you can then analyze and ask different questions of. You can combine data sets. And that's actually something our DivaWorm group does, although um, not with organoids. And so, um, you know, this is something that we haven't had time to really build. I haven't worked on it in a while, but I think we should um, revisit this. And it looks like Maduri is excited to be in the channel. So good. Can I uh, quickly ask, in, in, yeah. in, in the GISTI, did someone join 
I know Avery's uh, one of the fellow jesters, but is there someone new here? Or is that, who's, who is the other person? I don't know if it's, because I invited some people to the lab, but I just wanted to make sure if it's someone new that I'm not uh, leaving them out. I don't know. Okay. Cool. okay. Um, if you are new to the lab, please. Uh, there's oh, a chat. Inkit. Inkit Grover. Oh, Inkit. Hello. <laughs> hey. Um, glad, glad you're here. Uh, you can. There's a chat in the in the bottom if you're not familiar with it. If you want to just use that. Uh, but um, uh, you know, I know we're kind of in the middle of other stuff. But if, if you're around and you want to say hi, welcome to do it because I know you've been joining. Inkit's been on the cost of joining the lab for a little bit, so thank you for showing up today, at the very least. Hey, yeah, he said in the so chat. Hello, everyone, yeah. Um, but yeah, we can, not to put you on the spot right now, but if you want to say anything there, you can, or we can come back to that later. But uh, thank you for coming by. Yeah, yeah, and Inkit, I think, has a background in, like, machine learning and in a lot of that those type of models. Okay, <laughs> that's okay. Yeah, it's, you know, you get used to the environment here, but um, the buttons down at the bottom, yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so and hopefully you know we could um, talk in the channels ink it. Uh, I'm kind of going through them right now, and it gives you an idea. Okay, yeah, he's been busy building a small, simple optimization library, so he's definitely uh, you know has some skills in machine learning and deep learning. So um, we'll be maybe you know, talking with him more in a bit here or later in another, you know, in the Slack channels, definitely. So let's see, I'm going to go back to my screen. I want to go back to some of the other channels. Uh, so, yeah, that's Brain Organoids. There's the CGS group, which I think Jesse posted a paper on knowledge representation learning. Um, there's Cognition Futures, where I posted a link to the Mike Levin lab at Tufts which is always interesting to look at, see what they're up to, because they're doing a lot of stuff with sort of ranging from things like organoids. I don't think they actually do organoids per se, but they're doing a lot of uh, cellular differentiation stuff, a lot of electrophysiology of cells to like other types of really interesting questions involving yeah. cognition. I, I put in the open chat, we don't have to go there yet, but like, I'm, I'm what, like the way he mentions what he does is really cool anatomical and behavioral decision-making at multiple scales of biological, artificial, and hybrid systems. I like that's like, that's a, I'm going to use some of that language <laughs> because that's a really, like, yes, that's a great way to talk about some of the things we're aiming at. So, yeah. It's always like a challenge. Like, this is grant language. Like, you'll yeah. have, uh, you know, you'll say something like that and it's like, you don't know what that means, but it sounds really good. So, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and there was a there was a job posting for someone who wanted to do like bi like bi they would be biology based, uh, and I saw you probably see it in, in the other thing. But um, if anybody's really interested in Levin's work, there's an opening here. And I'm in Boston, and not Tufts is in Boston, and it's in it's it's a biology based. You need to be an undergraduate, but if you're if you're interested in Levin's work and bio stuff, you have a biology background, you can do do stuff with him. So that's cool. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, I don't know if they, data science has anything in it. Oh, yeah, it does. Uh, yeah, based so, on there. So, or, yeah. Okay. This, this uh, message here, when trying to solve a new problem using machine learning, find a public data set for solving a similar problem to yours. Solve the problem using the similar data set and compare results with a published one. If success, replace the public data set with yours. And that's, I, yeah, I mean, it's... Uh, I don't know if that's, uh, yeah, I guess the <laughs> message here is like, no. you find a problem, you kind of work on it, and then you have, I don't know about replace the data set, but like, you know, it depends on what you're working on. If you're working on something like a biological repository, you can't really replace it, but you can actually create something called secondary data sets. And something we do in, in DivaWorm, where you have... Uh, you know, you go to some raw output data that a group will provide from their experiments and you'll process it and then maybe ask some targeted questions or you'll uh, build a model of the 
sort of the phenomenon and you'll have like a computational answer to that. So a lot of the groups collecting data, um, oftentimes they're not asking the computational questions. They're asking like, they're collecting biological data or they might, you know, they might collect the variables based on their sort of rough understanding of the biology, but you can actually go ahead and ask computational questions like, how do we represent these data in space? So, you know, in, in the diva worm group, we've taken embryos and we've focused on how the cells are oriented in space, how they might potentially be connected in terms of signaling, how they, uh, you know, if you can track a cell over time and development, you know, can we build a data structure that takes the data and sort of maps it out in, in some other way than, than what you have in the data set? And so we can create all these like secondary variables and, and uh, build these data structures. And then we can publish a secondary data set that has all these features in it. So, I mean, in that sense, <clears throat> that's kind of following this advice. And I think this is good because there's a lot of secondary data out there. And it's a matter of like, you know, getting latching on to some system or maybe some problem finding data and then working on that. You know, don't try to solve every problem and or just kind of go from data set to data set and and try to, you know, work on problems that way, you know, really try to identify and target the data that you want to use. And it'll help you in terms of, salt, you know, kind of building your model and, and getting a good result, because if you don't have good input data, it's hard to do anything. So it's food for thought. Uh, looks like brain organoids. Okay, so Morgan posted something on uh, this is the resurrecting genetic variation in human brain organoids. So this is about the uh, uh, I think is it Neanderthal or you yeah, know yeah uh, Allison Motri who um, was the uh, last author on the kind of the first electrophys paper brain organoids uh, has been also working a lot on this. Uh, Neanderthal genes and what what happens with the organoids when when you're uh, you know uh, preferentially expressing certain genes, which you know is just fascinating, fascinating work. Yeah, yeah. So they're they're basically creating uh, like knock-in cells where they put a gene in or they they modify a gene and then they grow an organoid from that and. I guess that's my take on it, what's, what they're doing, which is something we do and you can do in cell culture pretty easily. Um, I imagine in brain organoids, it's just a matter of scaling that up to a three-dimensional um, setting, but then you have, you know, then you can actually create like the conditions for like having an organ that has that modification in it. So that's cool. I mean, you know, just think about all the possibilities here. <laughs> Anyways, uh, that's good. Um, ethics, society, and tech. Okay, hey, ink it. Hello. Uh, and then ethics, society, and tech. I think we've had a couple things in here this week. Um, <clears throat> let's see. We started uh, 19th, I think, was the start of the week. So um, I attended this event. Uh, I don't have a great link to it, but it's basically a clubhouse event, which is like the iPhone and now Android app where you just have like open, it's just people talking, it's very, it's just audio. But it was something like, uh, it was based on, so I think, I think Kai Fu Lee has a new book, maybe, uh, I don't know if you want me to try to show it or. Oh yeah, I can, here, let me unshare my screen for a minute. Okay, go ahead. Uh, uh, just to kind of, Visually show it, yeah. Um, real quick. Um, uh, so Kai it was basically about Kai Fu Lee's new book, which is about AI in in you know future of AI stuff. Can you see this? Yes. Um, and and so you know, um, it was it was this book. The uh, what's the best way to show this? I don't know. We we, we went over this book and. A little bit, and and um, apparently Jan, Jan's a fan and Mark Cuban, um, but it was a clubhouse, and it had it had a lot of people, 
the person who caught my eye there, as people who know me might might suspect, is Gary Marcus. Um, and and my my very quick review of of the whole the whole um, event was that the first hour was kind of a generic overview of the book, and I'm not I'm not out on the book, but it kind of felt like a very a kind of a a, a general positive view of AI is going to be great, and in, in 20 years it'll be you know X Y Z, and we're doing well, and, and so on and so forth. Um, but and kind of why I mentioned, uh, kind of why I mentioned this stuff uh, is um, these two. This was a cool person to find out their work, uh, Dikai, um, and and he, he did a lot of things with with all of these subjects. But he's also really interested in like AI ethics, and he's teaching an AI ethics course right now at. I don't know if it's Berkeley or someplace like that. Uh, so he's someone really interesting to look into because they had a, a really nice balance of things. Between him, Gary Marcus, and a few other people, such as, um, I think, this, whoops, uh, it's not really working. Uh, well, actually, I'll just do it like this. Um, as this person, uh, I see Azita. I was really cool. Um, between them and Gary Marcus, and I, I'll, I'll just make this very quick. Between them and, and Gary Marcus, there actually was a... Um, basically, the first hour was talking about the book and like exploring different parts of the book. And I really appreciate Gary Marcus because he constructively criticizes... You know, he's like, hey, I know you mentioned GTP3. This is great, but here's a limitation. Like, it doesn't understand conceptual concepts don't don't carry it over, it's just like analyzing very specific text. And and he's like, okay, what do you do about this? And and and, and there wasn't really an answer. It was just like, you know, this is a great thing we have right now on this direction and we're hoping to develop it out further. And it's like so that was cool. So the first hour was about the book, but then there was a really, really, really amazing and I re I recorded a lot of it, two hour discussion afterwards with Gary Marcus and some of the people I mentioned were just talking about AI ethics. And that discussion was was really good. Um, I don't have a lot of concrete things to say from it, other than um, if anybody sees any of these, these things and is curious about that, let me know because there's a lot of really good um, uh, 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 content and discussion about that, and some new people to look into, like Dakai and and uh, Zita and the other people that that I mentioned. So important. Uh, one of those little events that seems like it's going to be, oh, check out this new AI book, and oh, there's someone I like, and then it turns into a nice discussion, and then a really good discussion later. Uh, so sometimes it happens, and sometimes you get you get lucky. That's all about that. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Let me go back to the. We have a thing in the chat here. Uh, it sounds interesting. Post the links, recordings. That was Ankit. Yeah, I I basically used Otter. Dot AI to record a transcript of it, so I don't, I don't. It wasn't recorded, but I can share. The, I can try to find things specific in the transcript, um, and and make it accessible somehow. But yeah. Okay. Uh, let me share my screen again. I'm gonna try to go through this in the next couple minutes because I want to move on to different things. But uh, so that's. Yeah, that's their Ethics Society and Tech Update. Um, let's see if we have anything. General channel, maybe. Um, yeah, this is just administrative stuff. We have a, this is, uh, Jesse's been working on the uh, like a calendar in um, Notion. So for different things that are being submitted or, or you know, events that we want to share amongst people in the lab. So, you know, Neuromatch 4.0 is coming up. This Brains Through Time Reading Club, which is on uh, the evolution of brains. Uh, it's an interesting thing. There's an open-endedness panel coming up. There are a lot of things that we'll be putting on this calendar. I don't know if you can make this. I don't know what the best way to make this so that people find it accessible. I don't know. People, oh, I'm making people aware of it now. But is this something, Jesse, that's public? Like, mm -hmm. so people can view it? Yeah. Okay, so, you know, this is something that if you want to... I might, 
I might try to make like a Bailey link because Notion's uh, links are, are still kind of trash. Um, like the URL. You could make like a link dot tree, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Like and in the, that, we could have all the important links for exploring related to the organization. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm updating that, that slowly too. And if people want to add anything to that, also, like if people want to contribute to Notion directly, they can. Um, like, but uh, we can talk. If you're interested in Notion and, and the admin side of things, like DM me in, in Slack. Because we're making a lot of administrative updates and maybe getting some more people to, to look at specific aspects of stuff. And uh, yeah, this year. Yeah, we've been yeah. So we've been continually updating this stuff. So this this there'll be more on this kind of in the future. But I wanted to give people a chance to see kind of look across projects and and see all the things you know maybe things that are coming up, uh, conference or maybe a talk or maybe some other group part of the lab is doing something you had no idea that they were doing. So those are all, and this is a timeline. I like this because it kind of gives you like you actually open a link, like open a link. Oh, to that's the, more updated than the picture. Oh, okay. I don't know if this, I don't know if I'm logged into Notion here. It doesn't need to be, you should, like it should be public. Yeah. It might make you try to log in, but yeah. There we go. Yeah. So we're, we're now, uh, uh, MIT Neuro Symposium, you know, so there are things in here, this paper here, Psychophysical World of Bacillaria. This is a diva worm thing, but it's still in the in the lab. So then this uh, Bika conference, now this has been completed. We have the shared note documents for this in, in some of the channels, one of the channels. So mm -hmm. this is something that, you know, uh, we can revisit some of the stuff. I don't know if you can make notes on it. I guess you can. So on an event, could I make notes on this event? Uh, I could probably make it so that there, I could probably make comment sections in each of them so anybody could just make a comment on the page. Okay. Uh, let me see if I can do that. Um, but definitely as an admin or someone, you can make comments and adjustments. But let me see if I could, which one were you looking at just there? This, like uh, is for us, I be go. Let's see, let's see if I can. Just, oh, there's a comment section above it, but that's for people who are logged in. Um, let me... Well, maybe we just need to do this at an administrative level. So, I mean, you know, I just wanted to make sure we can archive things. Like if we wanted to put in like, this has a shared notes document. If someone's in, oh, I forgot about that. I missed it. They can go back and see things. Maybe it's something that, an action item that resulted from it. Yeah, um, you can see the live updating there. Yeah, pretty yeah. Cool. But like, um, there is a com if you're logged in a Notion, there is a comment section like right above. It. It's not displaying here, but it's for people who are logged in. So, um, but they might be able to find some work around to that too. So. Okay. That, yeah, that looks good. Um, uh, yeah, and this is going to give a layout of like the timeline of stuff because it could be there could be so many moving parts for things here that it's hard to keep track of. Um, a lot of the new events that are on there, I, I mentioned in the open channel Slack, so we can talk about that when we get there, the open forum. Oh, yeah. Okay, why don't we, yeah, why don't we go to that? Uh, I put a lot in there this week. Forum, yeah. So this is, let's see if we go back to the, <laughs> this is hard to figure out what was like the last meeting. Okay, so I think Wednesday was the first one for this week. Yeah, I put in that thing just above it uh, that's like the kids thing. Like that's that was cool if you scroll up. That was cool. Oh, oh, you can also see the, that, that's the thing I was talking about for Sunday was that actual, if you're curious about that, the, the, the Kai Fu Lee book, there's a link to it directly above the top of the page there. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's what that is. The, the, the AR thing, we don't really talk about that. Um, it was cool, but it's kind of a virtual reality thing for, for, for kids and, and teaching, but we can just move on. I know we're limited time, so we can go on the next stuff. Um, what is this here? Uh, oh, there's a neuroscience. This is a, like a woman in neuroscience, like base thing, but it's a sense of touch and, um, yeah, there weren't a lot of open seats for that. So check that out if you're interested. Um, 
the next item is just uh, kind of shouting out that other people are using Notion for academic related stuff too. So I think I clearly set the trend and everybody's following me because uh, I know MIT follows everything I do closely. <laughs> that's, that's not full humor. But that was a cool, another example of a website doing Notion stuff in Notion. And then below it was another event um, kind of adjacent at the Peak Hour Institute. Uh, this is this is like waiting lists already. So if you're interested in this, like apply. It's a very simple form. It was just a registration form, but like I, I did it and I'm already on a waiting list. So if you're interested in that, do it right away because hopefully a spot will open up for, for us. Um, and then, yeah. Um, then 11 stuff I already mentioned. And, and there's an opening for, for the bio person research edition. And then another a neuro event about um, brain space initiative talks. Uh, I think that's it. Yeah, this is uh, brain space, which is, I guess, just a bunch of brain related talks. Uh, this is, yeah, this is age related brain changes. So we have a channel, uh, the bio. We have another channel, Bioevolution, which is kind of like we were talking about aging at one time. And so a lot of that got folded into that channel. So that's another channel you might be interested in. Um, we haven't done a lot of updating on it, but. Um, yeah, o open open chat form is kind of like your generic stuff that maybe is related to the lab and just a free space to talk about stuff. Um, and also, like, I don't know if anybody else gets the GeekBot updates prompts for the daily stand-up, but you can feel free to comment on them, too. Like, like, like you basically reply to the GeekBot, and, and it has you these four basic questions, and you can share your updates if you want. Uh, so we can talk more about that later, but yeah. yeah. I think Random, I don't think Random has anything. Angela put a couple of things in there. Angela also, if you're just still around and wants to mention anything about her talks with Robin, you can, but I don't know if she wants to do that. So. Wait, what about my talks with Robin? Like, what's that like Uh, just saying, I know you talk a lot in random, and I know you mentioned stuff with Robin, I don't know if you want to say anything about that here, but if not, that's fine. Uh, I keep forgetting to mention orthogonal lab, but I feel like you would enjoy popping by, so I really should. Um, so far, we've just been talking about our opt-in legal system internet design, like um, an idea that I guess it would be cool. Hey, we could make one of these what we like work on, right? Um, basically, designing uh, low stakes, like you know how there are many antisocial, universally condemned acts that are actually legal. <laughs> it would be cool to somehow signal that you are willing to be held accountable, the right to be sued, basically, for if you commit any one of these acts um, through, like, opting into a legal system that someone could use. If they, like, catch you say something that's, like, really hard to, like, hold accountable, like, defaming someone else or something, like, you can just, I don't know, put in a deposit and someone else can put in a deposit and the winner gets twice back or something. I didn't actually think of the process, but he said that once we design the process and once we get a team going, he might commit to it. Like a big, you know, probably will commit to something like this because it would be really cool once the network effects get going. Yeah, I, I'm actually really interested in this and I don't know if there's a way to like bridge into that or, or if you want to talk about it at some point. So we could talk about the upcoming event. I don't know if, I don't know if this is the same event. Like, I don't know if people who, kind of why I mentioned who is they or the audience. Like, I don't know if people, new people. Huh? <laughs> what? You mean like for the data trust, the audience is like this rock wire community. Oh yeah, but like there, there was talk about like a, a, a conference in the future in November. And I don't know if we, people who are coming to the lab know like there were efforts to do their efforts to make an event about that sort of a thing. So, yeah. um, that's not the thing going on with that right now, but just like, that was, that was why I made that comment. But as far as like, you know, the, the Robin stuff specifically, like outside of, outside of that event or anything else, like I'm definitely interested in, in that. And, uh, if there's more, if there's ever more like concrete discussion or presentations about that, like either in here or not, um, I'm, I'm just definitely curious about that. So. Yeah, actually it would be good if we just get 
it, like something concrete going now. So if you make a channel for this like anti-cancellation community process or something, then I can add Robin in. <laughs> yeah. And we can be like, hey, look, it's happening. <laughs> well, yeah, I can. Well, yeah, I might be able to do that. Yeah. Like, why don't yeah. you send me more information and... Yeah, if you could send us information, I know. You, I know. Last time in in one of the discussions we had somewhere, you were mentioning like, oh, we're looking for like a, a a legal advisor team or like people who knew about laws or something. Was are you are you looking for anything specific in that sense? Um, a specialist who knows. Well, the issue is this doesn't exist yet. So um, right. he suggested I look for a specialist, but I'm not exactly sure because this doesn't exist yet. What kind of specialist I'm supposed to look for? So maybe I can just like put flyers on a bunch of random law schools. Hey, are you interested in this? I, maybe I, you could specialize here too. <laughs> I have some ties to someone who's interested in, let's say, advanced uh, law and technology and innovative oh. uh, parts of it. Do when, I know this person? Yeah, it's Val. So like, yes, I, I <laughs> I, I'm, you know, and I, I can reach out to her about, about some of this. So, um, like if there's any kind of a write up or a small presentation you could show Bradley and me, or or I could just I don't like I don't want to I'm not trying to some of this is like proprietary or new or like 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 in development like I'm not trying to you know mess with that but like if there's anything I copy left I don't really care so <laughs> you're always fine with me probably yeah if there's anything that you like have or want to or we can like maybe I will make the Slack channel and we can talk about it in there and and flesh something out there but yeah yeah so it's good to, i just i just remember the robin thing randomly now so i'm just bringing... <laughs> yeah the best part is that because what we're making is an opt-in internet legal system it doesn't matter where someone is from so val is actually perfect if she wanted to join i mean uh, yeah. i don't know if she's a specialist but you know like <laughs> she, she, she's she's very like looking at like sort of progressive law and technology stuff. So mm. it'd, be, it'd be cool to see what she has to say. Definitely. For those who don't know, Valera is actually the original, um, the original impetus for the society and ethics team in the lab. And it was my original co-author on the original project for, uh, we did like an AI and bias and law thing three or four years ago at uh, to celebrate New York Celebration of Women in Computing and and we, we, we I did a presentation there and, and she was a, like the reason that that happened is because of Valeria's um, input so she's sort of an alumni of that team in, in some ways. Oops. <laughs> Beat the buzzer. Sorry, I have a, a grocery delivery apparently to go get. So I'll be back in a moment and they close my alarm. It's really awkward, but right. hey, it's an old Boston apartment, so I'll be right back. All right. All right, so uh, let's see, we have a comment. Uh, so many great links. Thank you, Morgan. Yeah. So I think we're probably done with the Slack update. I just wanted to, you know, try to go over these once, you know, weekly, but, you know, we there is all sorts of stuff going on in the channel. So I didn't want to, um, you know, I don't want to spend the entire meeting on it, but uh, we have a lot of things here. We have another data science link, yeah. So Ankit asked, uh, by the way, does anyone have any ideas of what to do with GPT-3? So I, I don't know. We've talked about GPT-3 in the group, but not. we haven't really, I don't think anyone's really dug into it. Um, but it, we have had conversations about like, um, you know, what the potential of, of that type of technology is. So actually, if, if Ankit wanted to, uh, you know, kind of come up with maybe a, an idea, you know, and, and it can just be like some really, uh, blue sky idea of what what we might do with it or you know maybe explain to people in the group who don't know a lot about machine learning you know what gpt3 actually does because i think a lot of people are uh, not necessarily fully aware of the potential of it um, that would be good uh, but yeah we haven't like we haven't really dug into it but it's it's an area that you know there would be an opportunity there for us to, to get into that and, and to discuss it. Um, so, yeah. Uh, now, I wanted to talk about, uh, well, I should ask, does anyone have anything they want to bring up before we move on to our next order of business? Okay. 
Um, I'm gonna start. I'm gonna. I want to come back to Jesse, but he's busy right now, so I'm gonna come back to him. I'm gonna talk about some of the uh, other things that are going on, sort of in the near future. Um, so our submissions document is something we've. This has been put together since roughly the beginning of this calendar year. So we have a lot of things on it that have been addressed and put out there. Um, so we've had a lot of things accepted to conferences, some things that have been rejected, some things you're following up on. Um, there is this, uh, look at the bottom here, uh, we have this uh, new sort of, we, we've been looking at the NeurIPS um, workshops because NeurIPS is actually quite competitive and we might put together something for a workshop and we've talked about this in a, in a couple of different cases. This is MIC, MIC at NeurIPS. That I think is past. I don't think we're going to do that. Um, that was something that was uh, like a pragmatics in, you know, artificial systems and linguistic systems. That's not going to happen probably. But you, know, we can still attend that and 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 get ideas from it. Uh, there's this Metacog uh, workshop that Jesse pointed to. I think this week. This has a lot. We have a lot of potential uh, topics that we could cover in this that are lab specific um, and the due date on that is October 4th. So this is something that if we want to do this, this is the site here to this workshop. Uh, it's, uh, metacog it's on metacognition, which is sort of the cognition of cognition. So this is, uh, you know, they're interested in computing models of metacognition for perception, architecture and implementations of metacognitive systems. Uh, the applicability of something called dual process theory to artificial agents. Dual process is where you have like the thinking fast and slow idea. Um, that's what they mean here by dual process. Uh, uh, so a number of topics that, that you know, could be explored. Uh, I don't know what Jesse has in mind for that, but, but that's something that if you're interested, you know, yeah. raise that point. I, I, would, I would just say that's 100% happening. Like, okay. Um, I'm going to be starting on that this week. I uh, I reached out to Megan Peters because I thought she was one of the organizers, but she's just an invited speaker. Okay. Uh, I, mentioned, I also mentioned Charlotte. I know Charlotte's kind of a collaborator, but the main person is actually um, Steve Fleming, I think, and he's actually in UCL where Charlotte is in London. All right. Um, I, I actually uh, messaged Steve on his website, and I might just try to find a direct email or like on Twitter or something because I was like, "Hey, hey, uh, this is a really cool. Uh, anyway, I could volunteer with this workshop, and there's been no reply yet. Uh, so, but like, I really want to like, I'm gonna, I'm 100 submitting something because I want engagement with this workshop. So it's happening. If anybody's interested in this or like you know stuff from the uh, from the lab that's like there's a lot of there's a lot of adjacent things in the lab but even if you're new and just curious about the project and kind of want to like make it work or or see what you can do to, to be a part of that contribution it'll probably be a short paper which is like four pages and they have a long paper which is eight pages so it's probably going to be a short paper um about combining some of our like developmental ai stuff and maybe something from cognition futures that we're working on um, but that's definitely happening. So if you're interested, let me know. Um, maybe mention it in like, I don't know, anywhere in Slack, but the Cognition Futures channel too. So that's happening. Yeah. So our, our, when we discuss these things, this is kind of like a zoo of words here. Uh, we have a lot of things going on in the web with respect to art of AI and a life and cognition. So, I mean, you know, there, we have like, some of this broken down. If you watch some of the previous meetings, we talk about some of these things. But uh, you know, it, this is this is something that we have a lot of sort of thinking that's been going on about this. So, if we, you know, if you're really interested in like some of the tools and things, you know, please raise those points. Don't be afraid to ask what something is, uh, how it's applicable, and so forth. Um, so this is something, yeah, we'll, we'll follow up on this. I think next week it should be, we're pretty close to the deadline, like within a week and a half. So um, this NeuroMatch 4.0, so this is the ne next NeuroMatch conference. The abstracts on that are due October 25th. So 
I think by next week we should start thinking about things to submit for this. And this is something that you can submit on your own or that we can do it as a group. Um, they're looking for things like in computational neuroscience. There's some neuroscience, of course, and also, uh, you know, just some machine learning. So it, it ranges across those areas. So I know that, you know, a lot of people are interested in many different aspects of like neuroscience and cognitive science in this group. So this is this is something for all audiences, I think, in, in that area. So um, it's a very broad conference. If you've not been to this, it's virtual, so we don't have to worry about traveling anywhere. And um, it's it's very accessible. So Yeah. Oh, sorry. Am I... Did uh, you want to make... Yeah. Um, I would just say, uh, for those who don't know Neuromatch... Um, Anything that you want to do that's generically related to neuroscience or cognitive science, put together a project and do it. This is a tremendous opportunity to get exposure and practice. And you can either make a presentation about anything you've done, really, because it's it, like, and in the best way possible, like Neuromatch is really, really, really accessible. And if you have something decent, they'll find a way for you to put it there. So if you want to lead something, or tag on as anything in the lab that we've done before, Neuromatch. Like there'll be, I think there's going to be a number of submissions in the lab because it always has been. So like, like there's a lot of. It's just a, a really great way to get exposure to presenting, um, and a really wonderful community. If you want to be involved in like volunteering, um, I haven't seen any volunteer notices yet, but um, it's it's a very low cost or or potentially free event. Is very low. They very may intentionally make these events open access. Um, so, like, if you're, if you're, um, they're, they're trying to be very inclusive. Uh, so, I really, really strongly, strongly, strongly encourage anybody who's on the cusp of thinking about things or, hey, I would really like to show off. I can do this sort of neuroscience or, or biology related thing. Um, it's just a great opportunity to do that. So, if you have any questions, ask Bradley or or, or myself about it. They've both been involved for since its inception, which is last year, and, and even a little bit in the foundation parts. Like, in, it, it, it's it's been a really interesting evolution from 2020 until 2021, and what they've done with with the academies and the summer schools and, and the different conferences. So this will be the first conference in about a year, um, and and a lot of people are looking forward to it. It'll be a great time. So that's my plug for Neuromatch. I have the T-shirt. I got I bought a T-shirt because that's how much I like it. Great, that's great. Okay, so yeah, that's that's narrow match, and then finally we have this paper that I'm going to be submitting. And I think Jesse's the only one in the meeting now who's an author on this. But there was a. Uh, this, are you are you trying to say something about it? It's it. Oh yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, so there's this follow-up. We did this workshop, the EI workshop, which is Embodied Intelligence. And uh, three of us gave presentations. Myself, Stefan, who uh, doesn't attend the meetings much anymore, but has done a lot of work in this group. And, uh, and Jesse, who's here now. And so uh, there's a follow-up uh, paper for this conference in the Artificial Life Journal. So this is a special issue in there. They have a call for papers. And so I'm going to be submitting this paper on behalf of all uh, of five people who have been in the lab either now or in the past. So Stefan Dvoretsky, Zi Gong, Ankit Gupta, Jesse Parent, and myself. And we actually started this meeting series uh, with the five of us working on this uh, thing with Breitenberg Vehicles. So, you know, we're interested in this developmental version of Breitenberg Vehicles where, you know, you grow the Breitenberg vehicle from a, um, you know, a, a ver the simplest possible implementation to a, a more complex vehicle and then observe the behavior. And there are a lot of issues associated with that. This paper is sort of laying this out. Uh, we had a couple of approaches that we put together that sort of define this developmental approach to Breitenberg vehicles. Uh, so it's, it's a pretty long paper. It's like, I don't know how many words we're at, like, 13,000 or something. It's it's huge, actually. Uh, oh, it's only about 10,500. But it's, uh, 
it's pretty long for a paper like this. And so it's a little bit unconventional, the approach. You know, we've had, from this paper, we have at least two, if not three, open source repositories. So these, uh, you know, Ankit and Stefan and Z all created their own models. And uh, they're different versions. So like, uh, uh, Stefan focused on genetic algorithms, using those to model the development of a of a agent. Z used a, an approach uh, related to Hebbian learning and multi-sensory uh, integration. And then Ankit did some work, and there's a lot of math in here, by the way. Uh, Ankit did some work with uh, like collective behavior. And so, uh, so this is a screenshot from one of the apps. So we have like these different uh, pieces of software that are open source that are not like highly developed, they're not being formally released for pub. Well, people can use it, but it's like it's not something that like it's not a um, you know it's not a high level at a high level of development where we have a user community. So these are all different versions of this, and so I'm going to submit this paper to the special issue. I don't know how it's going to be received. It's a little bit unconventional the way it's structured. There's also a lot of like uh, theory and a lot of, uh, you know, I sort of building around this idea of embodied cognition and development, which Jesse has uh, contributed to the paper. And uh, so, I mean, you know, this is something that we've kind of, this is an earlier version of what we were talking about. I think it's still important to put it out in this, in this state because it, it does kind of focus more on the implementation step so we've talked a lot about these developmental operating vehicles and developmental AI as sort of a theoretical framework. And we've kind of worked on that a bit more, but this is like where we have these implementation steps sort of in place. And now it's, you know, people want to like pick up the ball with that and start developing. I know that um, Stefan is really interested in making his platform, which is Brajen Brain, making that into a more sustainable open source platform. But we haven't really done anything with that yet. We haven't put any real resources into, into sort of building a user community around that. But this, hopefully, maybe if this gets published in the special issue, you know, maybe we can get some more interest in that. Do you, do you want any, like, should we try to keep the paper as it is? Or is there any updates? Like, should we try to re revise any part of it? Because I don't know if I should invest trying to like update it or just as it is, that's what we have written and, and use that one. I think, what I th well, the deadline is like next Friday. So I think I'm, we'll just submit it as is. Uh, yeah. And then when, you know, we get some reviewer comments back, we'll probably have no doubt some directions to go. And, hmm. you know, that's when we'll do that part. Okay, okay. So. Yeah. All right. That, that's kind of what I was thinking, but I wanted to make sure like, cause I know, especially this week, I'm going to be focused on the, metacognition stuff and i was wondering to say like i know you i saw the email earlier this week about that i'm like okay should, should there be any you know should we should we do anything now or wait until that period but i think that makes sense yeah and you know it's like that's just the way like you know you don't want to because it's like if we do all this work and then they say well this is no good then we're <laughs> we've wasted time it's like we've already spent the it's actually in pretty decent shape i like i said it's an unconventional way to write this up. Uh, there, there aren't really that many results, but we do have a lot of different like ideas in there, and uh, you know we're putting in like basically implementation steps. So now we can go back to this paper and say, well, we we're implementing it, we're developing theory here, and then now maybe in the next set of implementation steps at some point in the future, we can add these ideas into what we already have in terms of software, because the software is not. Like, you know, we focused on one little piece of it. Uh, I don't know if we need to create any more software packages at this point. We just need to maybe augment what we have or, you know, um, well, we can figure that out. <laughs> so all that is, is um, all that is happening. So I wanted to bring people, yeah, I also wanted to bring attention back to the implementation steps because I don't think we've, we've gone back and looked at, thought about that software in a while. And it's there, it's open source. So if people want to play around with it or explore it in any way, that's that's something that we haven't done in a while. So that's that. 
Now, uh, could I ask you a bit about like uh, how did you use the genetic algorithms in your paper? Uh, well, yeah. So we set up a the, the way it was work way it, it worked was that you had this Breitenberg vehicle, so you had this embodied agent that have that has a nervous system, and the nervous system is usually a mapping from sensor to a factor, and the idea is you're adding in neurons and connections over developmental time. So, you know, we're, we're like having the agent behave in an environment. We have this genetic algorithm running, generating different topologies. And the topologies range from very simple, like a sensor effect or direct mapping to something much more complex. And you hit a complexity wall because, you know, you can't get huge uh, nervous systems. You can't get huge connections. But you can get something on the order of, I think, 20 uh, nodes. And so, you know, and then the idea would be the genetic algorithm would generate these and evaluate them in terms of their behavioral fitness. So is it moving in the environment? Okay. How is it moving? Where is it navigate? We, we were thinking about doing a lot of stuff with spatial cognition as sort of like... Uh, so test on that, that actually, uh, as, as I told, told you that I was recently working, working on this small optimization library, in that, that what, what I did or what I'm doing is that uh, I recently discovered a new method, like I'm, I didn't find any paper, but I only found a blog related to it, so I kind of implemented to see how it really works on the benchmarks and stuff. So the idea that I had and the, the blog person also had was like, uh, what the genetic algorithm is doing, it's only minimizing or maximizing at a certain point in time. So I thought, why not like, uh, change this algorithm in such a manner that like after a certain number of iterations if the cost is really bad like after like let's say you could choose the number of reversals so let's say if there are five reversals at that point you can choose like a hundred step length or some amount of step length and at that point it will uh, do a reverse uh, optimization process like a maximization process and so what I found was like in real problems, but that would help you with uh, with the plateaus and getting stuck in the local minima. So like maybe if I, uh, when I open source it, you could probably use that if you want. Yeah. And see if it works. Yeah. Yeah, that would be, that would be a good thing. And, you know, like I said, it's, it's just a matter of like, you know, putting in the right Sort of. So like with genetic algorithms, uh, we haven't talked about them a lot recently, but one of the things that, that like the trick to getting them to work well is to structure your algorithm. Like, you, you know, like if you have, like say for example, if you want to apply it to something where it's a complex domain, you might use building mm -hmm. blocks where you evolve things to a certain point and then you fix them. And then you evolve things, you know, evolve the next part of the program and so you modularize the program another another way to do it is to play around with how it like explores the fitness space which is to say you know you have this yeah. sort of energy landscape but it's instead of energy it's fitness and then you know you're climbing up but you don't know if you're getting to the maximum or to some local min maximum or minimum and so then that's how you have to like you you don't know what the the up the global uh, maximum or minimum is so you just have to use strategies like that I think that's that's something yeah if you want to explore that further I would definitely like to see if, if we could apply that to something in the lab because we do have the software and so you know yeah so I'll, op I'll work on it and I'll open source my work which is related to this reversal thing and uh, maybe like uh, if it fits your criteria maybe you could use it but uh, uh, but the thing is when i used it in my process i applied it on functions which are like continuous and stuff but my domain is discrete okay yeah 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 so that is something maybe you will have to see when applying but i think it should work because i uh, I also, I also compared it with other existing algorithms like your health climb, GA. And another strange thing that I found was, uh, have you, has anyone heard of differential evolution? Yeah, yeah, I'm not familiar with it too much, but I've heard of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So differential evolution is uh, another algorithm that I found was interesting. 
so what i did similar to g uh, sorry to d is was like i thought maybe why not you know take a g and just reverse the operations in it and i found that strangely enough just by reversing the operations like instead like perform mutation is sort of uh, what do you call it so so it can yield a very small uh, you know performance gain so like i think such things can be applied and like maybe if you have the code uh, maybe you could just switch the processes the uh, operations and maybe you could see some good uh, uh, the cost can probably improve yeah yeah you know because in essence what i realize is differential opera- differential uh, evolution it is using a differential somewhat there is that minus sign over there calculate the differential but if you remove the differential and if you look at the operation it it is basically like a simplified form of the d itself in a, in a g g a sorry so that's why i think it could work again again i'll open source it so uh, you guys will be able to use it okay yeah that would be great yeah, yeah. yeah. there's there's sort of a a potential like return to focusing on on that and developing it out like, like that whole project of all of the, the software we've been talking about before so it'd be great, great that people look at that again um and talk with us and, and maybe we'll get around to stefan again too yeah uh, so that's, that's great to look at that yeah could you share the link to the code oh yeah let me i'll put it in the slack uh after the meeting Um, yeah, I'll get to that. So that's good. Um, now I wanted to move on to something. And I know Jesse talked about this week. He had some things on um, some of the stuff he wanted to do. I don't know if he's... Uh, well, I wanted to talk about this first, but then we can maybe talk about that. Um, I don't know where he is with that. He, um, what? Like, like there, there were a few things that I mentioned. Like, 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 I have a new project. project. Idea, idea that I'm 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 fleshing out. Um, I don't know if I should talk about that or talk about the professional development stuff from the the fellowship I mentioned. Uh, what do you what do you want to do? I don't have much time left. Yeah, why don't we do like ten minutes on professional development? Okay. Um, just I'll share my I'll share this really quickly because I have this prepared. Um, so for those who don't know, I'm I'm in a fellowship program. Uh, that's. Uh, like, like NSF, NSF um, oriented, oriented or, or, or funded, funded, I suppose. Actually, actually hold on. on. Oh. Yeah. Uh, uh, where did it go? Hold on, here. Okay. okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. I, I got it again. Um, yeah, and this, this is what, what it's called. It's, it's like the CS grad, grad for US, which is really cool. cool. Um, um, it's, it's, it's an attempt to, to get people to stay. It, it basically is like, hey, we need. We need our, our domestic graduate students to stay, to get PhDs in the United States, States and stay here. So it's kind of a domestic effort to get people to do that. And it's, it's kind of with the NSF and, and the, the, the Computing Research Association is sort of implementing it because they have a lot more to tailor people to do the job. Um, and, and this was a good week. I, I really quickly want to go over this because I think having a, a little bit of professional development regularly in our meetings will be good. Um, and so we talked about, about a little bit a while uh for a while and just just there's there's a few things that like you know um i'll just really quickly go over uh just to, just to, to kind of do a cursory glance at them we, we went over the applying just applying to this is my pro, the, pro, the fellowship's designed for people to go into phd programs in computer science or computer information science uh, or engineering like a, a technical computer related field or information related field um so that's kind of what it's about but but this week was just going over some of these things um and i just wanted to mention them because the really good thing I, if for anybody who goes to a lot of conferences you'll, you'll come across and i really encourage you to go to conferences specifically for this reason of understanding how people are talking about how to talk about their how, how people are, are, are discussing what to talk about in their applications, whether it's grants, 
um, fellowships, applications, applications, jobs, like, like, like it's really good to understand and kind of stay current on how people are talking about things. things. And why I wanted to mention this, this set of stuff is because it was a nice, um, supplement to other things that I've, that I've been, um, a part of, let's say, um, there we go. This is a little better. Um, actually, I don't like that. Um, I, one of the most confusing things is that they focus a lot on this resume concept and it was kind of weird because I actually met with my advisor, um, yesterday, I, met, I, 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 I get assigned a, a mentor in the process, which is really cool. And we were kind of like, this resume thing is a little bit strange because I think more in terms of a CV and I think maybe they did resume because they thought people might, might not have a lot of research experience and I'm kind of a little bit of an odd odd duck and that I have a lot of research experience compared to other people in the, in the fellowship um but okay this is all typical stuff but uh, what I wanted to kind of you know focus on we're just just these sort of there's sort of like a few main points that they're looking at um when you're applying to stuff and this was this was sort of like uh, this, this was good to keep in mind. mind. So what, what are, are the basic fundamentals, fundamentals in this case, for whatever degree, degree like you can, you can generalize a lot of this, but what, what are the basic fundamentals that, that you should know and have? And, and in this case, case you know, I have a few courses in these things. I don't have a pure CS grad degree. I have an informatics degree. So what I took away from this in my sense is like, yeah, I should maybe brush up on these things or, or, or have a, a portfolio where I'm demonstrating some knowledge about some of these specific things or, or talking about them somewhere. Because I think that's something that as someone who doesn't have a pure CS background would be important for me to do. Uh, but, but general, what are the basics? Um, and again, going quickly through this stuff, we did these exercises in there, which were a little bit like reflective stuff like that. We're not going to do that today, unfortunately. Um, but, but what are Rascals looking for? Um, have you worked on projects? projects? Everyone here, um, this is why I encourage so many things um, in the lab and, and eventually get into a place where you feel comfortable leading some project and doing some independent work. Um, and also things like Neuromatch. Um, like, like Neuromatch, it, it, one thing is like, I really encourage people to, to get to know conferences in your general field or adjacent fields and in this lab, everything's so interdisciplinary, but like, no, there's different tiers of stuff. Like, Neuromatch is a really low barrier of entry, and that's fine. Like, don't see that as a negative thing. See that as an opportunity to get yourself, get your feet wet in something. And then you can use that experience to build on and do other places. Um, like, and it's so really important for that. Like, Dino Research is like, yes, but like, how are you doing it? I think it's a great thing to show. And, um, yeah. And, and this is like, like are you creative, creative but, but more so, so like, are you showing an ability to engage a topic, address, address potential, potential outcomes and choose ones and, and, and flesh that out, whether, whether it's, whether it's whether technical, technical or, or theory or conceptual, or like having, having ways, ways of showing that is, is significant. Um, and this is a good point that they made there. Um, are you, you self-motivated, self hardworking, and persistent? persistent? Especially for PhD, PhD programs, is the people who you know, are looking at that, it's, it's kind of like you have an advisor, but it, it, you know you're you're becoming you're becoming the director, of, you're the captain of the ship ultimately. So, are you are you good at that? Are you do you have evidence you can do that? Are you interested in doing that? Because you know, that that's a, a pretty big commitment. Something that I'm actually dealing with myself again now as someone who is doing a lot of adjacent work, but it's been a little bit of a um, it's a, it's a serious commitment for the, you know, several years you're doing the PhD, but also a serious commitment in terms of the outcome. Like, do you want to have a life vested in that? And we're looking to see evidence of that for sure. Um, I think this is the last one here. Uh, but this is again, like, this is a major boon for our lab. Um, showing that you can do independent and collaborative work is, is great. Um, because there's, There's elements, elements where you have to kind of show your own leadership, leadership and, and and it's just you and, and be in the spotlight and say, yes, make or break, sink or swim, I did this. 
uh, for myself and for this project, and I, I, I contributed this, and I sorted out all these things, and that's great. But then also being able to deal with other people, to show leadership of a project, to show collaboration. Um, and I think this is a really a major, really, um, this is a great thing about our lab in specific, because we have so many opportunities to show everything here, really. But especially this, um, um, like, like what we offer is a lot of opportunities to do this, so... Um, this, this is partly why, why uh, like, like if I didn't have my experience in the lab, I wouldn't have gotten this fellowship. fellowship. And I just want to kind of highlight how, how, how great that is. Um, I, I think that's, that's pretty, pretty much, much it, but, um, oh, oh, oh and Alicia Perry that excites you in sort of your passion statement. Um, and this actually has been a, a really difficult one for me because I'm interested in so many things, but, but finding specific, uh, areas that you want to contribute to and like become an expert in and, and push forward uh so being able to show that in in your in your statements and your, your 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 uh how you communicate everything to them i think will see through uh, and be very important um yeah and this is all the basic stuff but i'll keep it at that that was pretty much an early quick overview um so yep that's, that's what that is uh whoops yeah, Where are I? I can't seem to get back to my screen to close out of it. Okay, Just, uh, uh, there we go. There we go. Great. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you for that. Um, one point about that is that this, there's a difference, kind of in in the U.S. anyways, between a CV and a and a resume. And in England, of course, they call everything a CV. Um, and I don't know what in India or other countries what they do, but in North America, I I think you could say that there's the CV, which is a longer document. And this is like for academic, usually for academics, you know, you list everything, your publications, your research projects, everything. The resume, of course, is for a, a, a job that's non-academic and it's usually shorter. You know, it's like a one page or two page thing and it just lists your jobs and your responsibilities. So I think there, you know, in CS you're doing like you have this, you straddle this line between like, you know, applied research, corporate jobs, and then academia. And so in academia, you use a longer version of your, what we call a CV, what the British call CV is like your resume. So it's, you know, it's a little confusing there, but I think, <clears throat> I think in both cases, you want to develop it so that you have a very, I think a very uh, succinct description of what you've done. And, you know, if you've done things that are not, just because you, you know, you may have done a project and just because you maybe didn't hold a certain title doesn't mean you didn't do things in a, you know, didn't have experience in things. So like, for example, if you do research, you're going to be doing a lot of different things. You're going to be managing the project. You're going to be like analyzing data. You're going to be doing all these things, presentations, creating presentations. So you, you know, those are things you can build upon and say, I've done these things in this position. Uh, have experience in this area and especially for younger people it's you know that's what you have to work with because you just haven't had the time in in the in the work in the workforce in the research you know uh environment i think jesse has a lot of experience for his sort of you know uh level of you know he's not in graduate school really but he's yeah i think you've got like a phd student you know worth of experience so i think you're you're in pretty good shape but that's yeah. something that you know you can you can point to in a cv and say this is what I, I led this project or i've done this thing and oh go ahead oh, oh no, no go, you, you can finish, finish. Oh, that was oh, I'm pretty much done <laughs> oh um yeah, yeah i would just say definitely, definitely with that, that and like if people ever have any questions about their cv or um applying to anything let bradley and i know bradley is really good and always 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 been there for a lot of recommendation or insight about how to apply to stuff and we really try to make that a part of the lab and and like i'm i'm i've i've over the last like year or two i've really I've been looking at a lot of applications and reviewing a lot of stuff from a lot of friends and colleagues so like this is a really good resource about you know, you know, if you're, you're looking, looking to apply to something, something and you want advice or like, hey, look at my, my resume or my CV or I don't even I don't have 
how do I how do I, how do I talk, talk about this experience in an effective way to get a, a grant or a fellowship or whatever? Let us know. Like we can actually, if it's useful to people, um, we could make a Slack channel that's just specifically about like, you know, professional development. Like I have a question about applying to whatever. Or, or and like, like maybe, maybe not maybe just DM us, but whatever you want to do, like reach out to us because we're both very interested in in that, that and, and and I think that's uh I, I think I think the lab offers so much in terms of people who care about developing our members, but also like if there's a specific uh niche that you want to get into and is kind of really really related to what we're doing we can we can we can help you tailor a project to that end um and that's i think that's something that honestly you don't find a lot of places and that's the benefit of of our setup is we have we're not constrained by uh a lot of departmental politics or funding constraints um as some other academic institutions might be and and so Use, use that, that to your advantage. Like that's what we can. That's that's a, that's a, that's, a, that's a very special thing. Uh, believe it or not. So, any conversations about this? Feel free to, to engage in that discussion. We have a couple things in the chat here. Uh, Ankit asked, "How are you managing time?" By the way, I'm thinking of applying for a master's, and I'm swear I'm struggling with interests. Um, managing time. I, 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 I think that, like, in the, like, in the most general sense, sense unless, unless you want to specify that, but, like, managing time is, uh, is it's something I'm really, uh, like, that's been a major focus for me right now, because for those who, who don't know, and I don't want to make this a talk show about my stuff, but, like, uh, my life changed dramatically in May. Uh, I, I, I joined a startup for a little bit. I got a new job. I went to the U.K., I, I did a, a small grant there with Avery, who I think is yeah. um, so time, time away there doing stuff. stuff and, 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 and then I came back and went to Boston. Boston so like all of that was just like, like in a way, it was great because I had no capacity to. It was like a mandatory vacation from deep research thought and stuff. Uh, but it also was a, a, a whirlwind is the word that I'm using. And, and now, now that I'm back in a stable place and stable position, thinking, thinking about research and getting involved, getting excited about, about this conference, getting excited about, about I'm not, I'm going to have time to go into my big research plan because I know what other things we want to do. do. But like, I'm, it, it, it's, it's tough because, especially if you're working, um, which I am, I have jobs and like having a routine that, that works for you is important. And it's, like, like some people are like, oh, I gotta wake up really early. Some people are there's a lot of individualization, but just finding I, I'm moving more and more and more towards trying to just block out. Like like like, like if, almost in, in the Cal Newport sense that Avery talks about, like getting getting allowing yourself to have deep flow states and just blocking out time and saying, For this time period I'm gonna work on lab stuff, I'm gonna work on my applications or whatever. Like that's this is a very standard advice, but like I'd be happy to talk more personally about what that means to you. Uh, but like it's definitely, if you want to go down a specific path that involves creativity and research, whether it's writing or arts or whatever, like you kind of have to give yourself time to go into these really important states. And like I find that my quality of output and actual progress in anything is dependent to that. And, and like, like, yeah, you can, can fudge stuff at the last minute and, 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 and a lot of academics work by deadline and that's just how it is. But like, like as much as Bradley's, Bradley's been really good about this because Bradley's tries to kind of stay ahead of the curve and I'm still learning how to give space so I don't get deadline crunched. Um, so that's that's a major thing for me and, and the whole is the process. So, yeah. Ink, it said, I found I need more deep flow states. I think everyone does. <laughs> I think that's uh, uh, it, it's, it's like there's a whole conversation to have and like with I know I know Angela's really aware of this about like the distractions and being able to focus and getting your sleep and how that affects everything you can do and I've had terrible sleep uh, for a long time but especially recently so 
I, I, I'm, I'm working on that. that. It's like, the, I kind of actually like in what I'm, because I'm, 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 I'm very seriously trying to get into a PhD program and do that as a life. So almost, it's almost as though, you know, sometimes almost as though you try to sleep, but know that thought, that idea comes at night. And yeah. then you cannot sleep. Yeah. yeah. And you end up working all night. Yeah. yeah. Scared that it might go away. And, and it's like, like I, try I try to take notes, notes but like voice messages, messages sometimes, but sometimes you just you do it anyway. So that, that's a tough thing, thing for sure. sure. Um, and, and I was going to say, like, it's almost like, like at times it's like you're training for the Olympics. Olympics. Like, like you have to dedicate your mind and your body. And, and there's like, like there's like this whole, whole like, like we've talked about this in the past, but so we had a little bit of professional development. It's almost like there's a little bit of like, like a martial art to dealing with both the information flows that are constant. And, and some are very distracting. distracting. And, and how do you deal, deal with like, oh, this paper and this news article and whatever? And, and I need to sleep and, and eat. And it's, it's like it's, it's a very particular lifestyle. lifestyle. There's, there's a great there's a great community on social media, media. Uh, even, even like, like Instagram, Instagram and Twitter. If you look at the right stuff and not 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 a lot of problems on social media. But if you use social media, there's some very good communities around academic and graduate school life. And I even mentioned this to Avery because a lot of the struggles are. Are, are similar, similar to, to other other things we're all dealing with in terms of managing time and support and there's good good, good stuff about you know people with different, different uh, needs, needs and issues, issues that come up in those areas so find a community that, that supports it and you know talk, talk to them and talk to us so I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that we can move on to other stuff yeah Andrew agrees with that apparently in the chat so uh, that's good uh yeah I'm gonna well, we can talk about this more offline, and I think we should because it's it's very interesting, especially the deep floor state thing. If we have ideas, oh. strategies for enabling that or maximizing that or whatever, sh please share them. Uh, we can do open chat, whatever. I would recommend uh, to read Ikigai. Someone, someone has not read that, that. that. because uh, a while back, back even I was having, having some problems related to that, that. deep floor state stuff, stuff like that. that. So. so in that, that book, book, I think uh, it's explained really, in, really in a short manner, like how and why you need flow state. Like uh, I'll, I'll give a slight TLDR of what he says in the book. Like he says that uh, in order to be in a, like uh, a flow state or a deep flow state, like you kind of need to like work on a task that's neither too difficult nor like uh, it's like too boring. It needs to be just the right amount that you can move forward with it. So I usually, and the other thing he suggests is some, the author suggests is like someone like Pomodoro or something. And I have followed this a little bit. Like I do Pomodoros and then I don't know when the Pomodoro stops. It just, I just flow into that state. So I can share uh, the picture that I have from the book. Maybe, Maybe that, that can help yeah. if anyone is looking for strategies. Yeah, I think this would be a good thing to put in. Like, uh, I don't know if we have a full channel for this, but like, definitely, this would be a great thing to talk about in Slack and share things there, resources or ideas for sure. Yeah. Uh, Maduri had to leave, so thank you for attending, Maduri. Um, and then finally, I think we're going to finish finish up here 10 to 15 minutes or so on some papers and ideas that... Uh, so the first one I wanted to share was, everyone can see my screen here. Okay. Uh, so we talked about two weeks ago, there was this uh, BICA conference, which is Biologically Inspired Cognitive Architectures. And uh, there was a nice conference. We have some shared notes on that. Uh, they talked about a lot of different things. This is, you know, AI, but it's also kind of like, how do you achieve AI, you know, kind of, uh, a more brain-inspired approach. So a lot of people were talking about uh, full systems and things. There was some talk about development. But they bring up a couple of these uh, cognitive models. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about that. So the first cognitive architecture that... It, and these cognitive architectures are widely available. Uh, so these are something that you can work with on your own. Uh, the first one is ACTAR. And ACTAR has been around for a while. This is a cognitive architecture. This is a, what they mean by a cognitive architecture is a theory about how human cognition works. So it looks like a programming language, but the programming language itself is this way to describe what is going on in the brain, what's going on with cognition. 
And so you can build a lot of agents using this ACTAR architecture. Uh, you can see that they go back way back to 2004 with a publication, An Integrated Theory of the Mind. Uh, and they published some books on it. Um, this actually goes way back to Alan Newell, who uh, is a luminary in, in AI research, uh, kind of talking about some of these aspects of the human mind occurring in the physical universe. So this was inspired by Alan Newell's work. Um, and so, you know, you have these, you have this programming language that you can, you know, program different tasks and then see how these things are executed. So it's a very cognitive science type approach where you can describe what's going on in the brain and, you know, you have this order of operations. And um, so they're actually able to, you know, map these results to fMRI data or other types of data. And so uh, people use this, a, a lot of this for like programming agents for video games or for other artificial intelligence platforms where you need to have like this thought process. And so this, that's what a lot of these cognitive models are trying to do is trying to get as close to sort of human thought as they can. So like a recommender system or a conversational agent would be other examples of ways you could apply this. And so this is a very much a boxes and arrows type of model where you have these different things. You know, you have the ACTAR architecture, you make some assumptions about human cognition from psychology experiments. You put it into this ACTAR model and then you get this, uh, this, you know, you can model cognition. But of course it depends on your assumptions. So if your assumptions are good, then you'll have a good result. If they're not, then, you know, this isn't gonna paper over the, uh, the errors in your assumptions. So you have these uh, quantitative and qualitative measures that you can match your model to. So there are different things like accuracy, fMRI data, latency, and this allows your model to make predictions of experiments that you can run on humans uh, and match them up that way. So, you know, these are, these models are, um, you know, they're, they've been widely published. Um, you know, you have different things like memory modules, perceptual motor modules, things like that, pattern matching. So you have this symbolic and sub-symbolic division, which we've talked about actually quite a bit in the group, where, you know, you have the sub-symbolic process, which is more like our uh, modern deep learning, where you don't really have a lot of symbolic representation. And then you also have symbolic representation, which is pattern matching, but with like labels and things like that. And so, you know, we, we, we talk about AI and we talk about uh, GoFi, which is good old fashioned AI. And a lot of that focused on sort of the symbolic processing that goes on in the brain. And of course we have with neural nets and other things, we have sub-symbolic processing. And the key is to, to match these up and to bring these together. And so they claim to be able to do that with ACT-R, but this is something that is, a, I think, a long-standing um, uh, project. And it's not something we're gonna necessarily solve with one architecture. There's a competing architecture, which is SOAR. And SOAR is this architecture where we have, uh, it, it operates very similarly to ACT, uh, the ACT architecture. Uh, there's this robust community of users here. Um, I'm trying to find a good example of SOAR, but it's basically a similar type of thing where you have this, these, uh, you know, this model of, of the of cognition. You run your uh, your specific application through the architecture, and it outputs a lot of these behaviors. And so there, you can see there are a lot of uh, uh, different. Uh, publications that have come out of this. Um, this is John Laird, who is one of the founders of this architecture. Uh, you can see John Laird is in the publications a lot. So this is like, again, modeling human cognition in different ways and then coming out with some um, results. This is a standard model for the mind towards a common computational framework across artificial intelligence, cognitive science, neuroscience, and robotics. This was published in AI Magazine, and this basically goes over a lot of what the uh, the SOAR model does and, and some of the other. There's also Sigma, which is another cognitive architecture. So, you know, I don't, I think they kind of briefly talked about these models at the uh, Beco 
uh, conference, but I wanted to like give people a heads up on what they were and kind of, I'm not gonna go through deeply on how they work, but this is something that we get. Um, it's basically rooting cognition in physics and rooting it into some symbolic set of processes that can generate uh, intelligent behavior. That's basically the goal. And they you know, use it at sort of the level of a modeling language, a programming language. So this isn't just something that's magic. It's something that you can follow through in an order of operations and modify as needed. So this is something that um, if you want to know more, you can read about it. Um, the, the third thing I wanted to talk about was this is Melanie Mitchell, who is, so, you know, she's, she's been critical of a lot of the deep learning revolution to some extent. Uh, she's not been as critical as Gary Marcus, but she's also been very thoughtful on some of the other things going on in, in, in modern AI. And she's actually worked with, she was a student of Douglas Hofstadter, who wrote the book, Go to Usher Bach, which is a very good book. And we should maybe review that a bit in the meetings as well. Um, her work, her doctoral work focused on um, this the program called Copycat, which was a computer program that uh, was based on finding analogies in, um, in data and in language and, and kind of working from there and creating an AI. And so uh, actually Douglas Hofstadter also wrote a book on something called Fluid Analogies, which are, I think they were working on this idea in that in that research group, and, and this is sort of the um, outcome of that. So Copycat has been around for a while, but it's a good program because it, it, it's a different take on say like something like deep learning, where you're analyzing large amounts of data. In this case, you're actually building models of of analogies. So you know if I say like this article is like um, you know reading a very good or uh, well. I don't know, driving a very nice car, then that would be a compliment, right? And maybe, you know, if it's something vague, like this article is like, um, maybe like uh, uh, going to a concert, you know, it, you could have had a bad experience at a concert or you could have a good experience at a concert. And it's like, depending on your experience, those that analogy can go either way. So, I mean, you know, this is this is the kind of thing that you can explore with analogies and it's, you know, something we don't talk about as much with, with when we talk about symbolic AI, you know, you might think, well, it's just a matter of manipulating symbols, but actually there's also this an analogical approach. And there are a lot of other things in cognition that are, you know, worth kind of select or kind of focusing on. And, you know, when we say general intelligence, we mean what? We mean this thing that we haven't really decomposed <laughs> Uh, that we kind of just kind of consider as a whole thing. And I think we need to step back and say, look, you know, there are a lot of different components to cognition or to, to intelligence that we want to kind of look at with something like deep learning or machine learning, we're looking at one part of that. And that's largely the pattern recognition part. But in, in you know, there are other, many other different ways that we use our intelligence to engage with the world. And so, you know, we, Analogy making is important to AI because it overcomes some of these blind spots when we just say like, we're gonna create intelligence and then focus on one aspect of it. Um, you know, we, we miss some of these things that analog these functions that analogy does or that some of the other symbolic approaches do. And, you know, we can talk more about that in, in future meetings, but I think, you know, it's worth kind of maybe even kind of stepping back and, and thinking about all those areas that what intelligence does and how it's useful, not just in humans, but in animals. So, you know, uh, they bring up this GPT-3 example where, you know, it's self-supervised learning. There's also meta learning, but those things map to cognition in certain ways. And it's sort of assumed that, you know, you're kind of solving intelligence when in fact you're solving a specific problem in intelligence. And so this is all important to, to understand when we talk about simulating intelligence or simulating language, you know, you're going to, GPT-3 is going to make some errors uh, in very basic errors that I uh, say a human wouldn't make, but otherwise it's, performance is very good. So why is that? Um, so in copycat, it's doing something that they call structure mapping. 
And this is uh, the structure mapping work focused on logic-based representations of situations and making mappings between them. And so Ken Forbus and others use the famous analogy of the solar system to the atom. They would have a set of sentences in a formal notation called predicate logic, which is something these in linguistics, describing these two situations, and they map them not based on the content of the sentences, but based on their structure. So, you know, we talk about our uh, geometric, uh, contextual geometric structures, and this is a different way of thinking about sort of uh, our cognition in relation to culture and, and sort of our social structures and, and societal structures. And this is a similar thing to that, where you're not thinking in terms of the content of the sort of what's being generated by the, the brain or generated by the intelligence, but sort of the structure of that. And so, you know, there, there are things even there where you have to think about, you know, that sort of what the intelligence is embedded in, the context and the sort of the way it's structured. So, um, you know, these are all things that, you know, we, get, we, we need to think about. Um, and, and the reason I, I get into things like this is because, you know, I want to make it, I, I want us to kind of think about these things more broadly. Uh, think about like some of the roots of, of some of the cognitive models that we use or when we say cognitive model, what does that mean? So um, I'm going to stop here. I see that uh, we have three people left. So, or besides me, thank you for attending uh, Ankit and, and uh, Avery and Jesse um, and also Morgan and uh, Maduri. Do we have any questions about any of that or? Um, I, I mean, I have a lot I can say about it, but I, I don't want to I'll let anybody else. Uh, I found an interesting link related to what you were sharing. Where could I? Yeah. Uh, which channel should I post it in? Yeah, post it in the chat. You can post it in the chat here or, or in any Slack. Okay. I'll post yeah, Slack would you work for a minute right now. <laughs> I think uh, this... I, uh, while, While I was attending Neuromatch, I, I found this paper. paper. It's by Cording. It's, it's a paper where he's trying to solve a MNIST or like machine learning task by uh, instead of using like deep learning, he's using creating uh, a neuron, simulate like how to I say this. I'm not really finding the correct term, but uh, he kind of programmed a neuron and different types of neurons and uses it in a tree structure something like that and with that he's trying to solve these machine learning tasks so this is i think a little bit similar to symbolic non-symbolic ai which you were talking about cognitive structures yeah this is like dendritic computing and that's another area that you know so the dendritic computer or dendritic computing is like basically taking a neural network and saying you know we're not going to focus so much on the cell and on the connection, the synaptic connection, which is what they're trying to simulate. Well, we're going to focus on the dendrite, which is, uh, you know, integrating incoming information and, uh, you know, computing on that. So there's a whole literature on this where people have looked at this part of, of the brain and, and this part of the function of the nervous system. And so it's really interesting. We can talk about that another week, but this is, you know, the, yeah, so there are a lot of different parts of the complexity here that we want to get at and um, you know, like obviously cognition is one, different parts of intelligence is another, you know, culture is another. And then, you know, even like in the brain, what are we simulating in the brain? Are we simulating a connection between neurons? Are we simulating dendritic uh, sum, uh, summation where you have multiple sources coming into a cell from other, all different neurons coming together? Uh, what do we actually want to look at? And so I think that yeah, this is a cool paper. I didn't, I don't think I've seen this before. And he's using an MNIST uh, benchmark. So this is good, uh, good stuff. We'll have to talk about that maybe next week. Yeah, yeah could, could you, you post, post the link to the folder in <coughs> the Slack probably? Yeah, I'll post the stuff in the Slack. Actually, yeah, so... Um, I put I put the article in the in the bio. I put uh, Ankit's article in the, in the bio um, chat channel already. Okay. Um, so that's there. Um, I have a lot of. We don't have time today, but but I'm I'm working on a 
a project, project and a vision that kind of maps out. out. I have a very specific implementation, like a specific thing I'd like to do. Uh, and and uh, I'm, I kind of envision this set of products around it. That I, I've talked to Bradley about it a little bit already. Um, what I would add, I'm just, I'm going to kind of just speak to that really quickly, just, just to say to Bradley. I talked, I came up a little bit with my, my talk with the mentor yesterday. And, and I want to ask them a little bit more because they mentioned, it's funny because they mentioned not as a response to what I said, but in an adjacent context of, they also mentioned robotics and they also mentioned some like VR, AR stuff that's kind of adjacent to it. So I feel like things are converging here. And, and as far as my, my project, I, it's going to be interesting because I don't know, I could see myself in a computer science, like there's three, three general applications, like the two things I just mentioned, and then also kind of related to my original effective computing work where I was like doing video segmentation, like, like segmenting different parts of like, uh, the discussions between the different players in, in the game or the community or whatever. So there's sort of like a computer vision aspect and then the, the robotics and the VR thing and the ways to do it. And so outside of that, and you, you, you actually anticipated this in some of your, your readings, which you do often, and I appreciate that. I want to look at ways of model of cognitive modeling stuff, but also like I'm on a quest to look at how we are representing just representations in general. What are we doing computationally that involves representations of other entities? I think that that's a sort of a starting point for me because there are a lot of ways to feed into that through, through social robotics, through robotics, through VR, AR, and other AI stuff. So it's like I'm, I want to start looking at like representations of other entities, and, and like there's like one of the articles I mentioned before is like social intelligence or social AI or something. And this is all very, 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 very brief notes. I'm talking about it later. But this kind of Do you much. mean like uh, the social network theory? Something like that? Uh, no. Um, but more so because when you're talking about representations and different ways to represent, what I'm looking into right now is related to like uh, social network analysis and stuff. And that basically you can use graphs to represent different entities. So like maybe you could look into that and recently there has been a lot of work related to that. Like people have started using graph machine learning and stuff like that. Yeah. Like graph CNN. So I think that like maybe that would be good if you want to look into it. Yeah. I will. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, we actually were talking about this in the Devo Room group, which is on Mondays. And uh, so I might get some crossover materials and put it in the chat that um yeah so i mean that yeah I, i'm glad that you found that useful I, I just wanted to go through a lot of those topics uh mainly because we hadn't really hit on them directly and i wanted to make sure that we covered that but that's good jesse that you're building and like i said in the slack this is like you know what they call uh horizontal integration so like we have these projects that we're building up and then you know, we can, there are things that we can do across projects. So, you know, you're thinking about things like VR or robotics or something. And then even if you have a specific project where you want to do some research, you know, that crosses some of the implementation crosses projects, but also some of the, some of that work will cross projects too. Not every project, but like, you know, you can see and think of the projects, the conceptual stuff as being sort of uh, vertical and then the implementations and different things like that are horizontal. So, you know, it's yes. a, right. so, um, well, thank you for meeting and I think we'll wrap up now. And uh, if, we have, if we have any other discussions, we can do it in the Slack or next week. So uh, have a good week. It was great to see